singing what the Lord's done for him. I praise God. I know, Lord God, that Sister Blanche and Sister Aldridge are proud. Praise God. Hallelujah. This time, I'm going to turn the service to our pastor, Brother Shelton. Praise the Lord. I want us to give the Lord a hand of praise tonight. <clears throat> I want us to praise him for numerous things. If I started making a list, we'd be here the rest of the night. But I want us to praise him for touching Sister Angel the way he did. And I want us to give him a hand of praise for the miracle that he worked in this young man's life. Ah, I could run around this building for what God has done in this young man's life. He... Listen, you hadn't really heard him sing yet. You just heard little bits and pieces that come out. That's all in there. That boy can sing. And it's not just a matter of the talent, but I can see the Lord on him while he's singing. And that's what makes the difference, the Lord being on you when you do something for him. Amen? I'm so proud of Jaden. I just don't know how to put in the words and convey to you how proud I am of the, the, what God's doing in his life. It, it is a God thing. God did that. God did that. Prayer still works. I want us to give God a hand of praise for Eddie and Donna. We've missed them. Amen. Glad he's better. He's been very sick. And uh, I'm glad that God put a good good lady in his life to help take care of him while he was sick. Amen. It's a good family. I love this family dearly. Glad to see Aaron back. I love him. Give him a hand of appreciation. I love you, son. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Amen. You come around here, you'll be loved to death. We'll love you good. We'll love you right up. Amen. God's people are loving people. We're not mean-spirited people. We're not people out to hurt people. We want to show people the love of Christ. Amen. The love of God. I appreciate the love in this church. I'm glad for the love of God I feel in here, and I'm glad for the Spirit of God Amen. that I feel in here. Amen. Appreciate him touching Sister Garen tonight. Amen. God can just one touch of heaven, and everything changes. It changes our thinking, the way we feel in our bodies. It changes our faith. Just a touch of God can change everything about us, and I'm so glad. Amen. We're going to get into the Word of God. I, you know, I, I want to preach bad here tonight. And uh, I got a message I've been working on. I believe God's laid on my heart. And uh, I'm not going to preach anything to you here tonight that is my opinion, just my thoughts or my own personal ideas. I'm just going to preach straight Bible to you. What you do with it will be between you and God, not between you and me. I'm going to preach straight Bible to you. And uh, I pray that it will help somebody, <clears throat> somebody watching online, somebody here. My grandfather used to say, and I believe this is still true, if you don't want to hear the truth, you don't need to come here. Amen? The Bible says we're to speak the truth in love. And I just want to preach what I believe God's been dealing with my heart here the last little while about it. I've had a burden about it. And uh, I, I know where I'm preaching. I know to who I'm preaching to. 
But sometimes we need a good reminder of why we live like we do. Why we believe what we believe. It's a terrible thing for somebody to ask you, why do you live like that? You don't know why. Well, that's because what my church does. Well, that won't get you to heaven because churches do a lot of different things. We have to know what we believe and why we believe it according to the Bible, to the Word of God. Genesis chapter 3 tonight, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I told Sister Shelton, I said, I got a long, a long message tonight. So please don't just turn me off. And please don't just walk out on me without leaving. Stay with me to the very end of this thing, and I pray it's going to be a blessing and a help to each one of us. It'll help us with our testimony. It'll help us with our witness. And why we live the way that we live. Amen. Genesis chapter 3, begin reading in verse 7 tonight. Father, I stand here humbly this evening. I've already felt that kind of touch from heaven that makes everything easy when we do it for the Lord. Thank you for touching our brothers and sisters tonight. Thank you for answering prayer, Lord. Thank you for the song that says, I remember the day. I'm glad the Lord touched us and changed us and saved us, sanctified us, and is sanctifying us. Baptized us with the Holy Ghost and fire. Anointed us to be preachers, to carry the gospel, Lord. To be witnesses in, of you in a dark and lost and dying world. I thank you for Jalen, Brother Jalen, being up here tonight singing, God. Uh, the change that you've made in his life, Lord, as you've made in each one of our lives. We love you, Lord. Uh, help us now with this message, God. Uh, I know there will be people, probably not here, but that watch online that will stop their ears to this. They may get angry. Some will get mad. Some will get sad. But thank God for those that will be glad for hearing the word of God. Touch us now, Lord. I, I pray for that kind of touch that makes preaching so easy. We'll praise you for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Genesis chapter 3. Begin reading in verse 7. Bible says, and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now, before they sinned against God, they didn't hide from God. They would walk with God in the cool of the day. They were in relationship with God, fellowship with the Lord. But now when they sin, the first thing they do is try to hide from God. The Bible said in verse 9, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. The moment they sinned against God, instantly they were ashamed of their nakedness. Prior to that sin, they were completely naked. There was no shame in that. But the moment that sin entered the picture, shame came with that sin and that nakedness. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? I'm going to bring you over to verse 21, please. The Bible said, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And you give God a hand of love and appreciation as you're seated tonight. <laughs> Praise the Lord. If you will give me a little time tonight, then I will try to do better on Sunday morning if the Lord tarries this coming. Anybody believe that? Even Donna laughed at that. <laughs> I want to share with you a letter here. I told you about on Sunday night, I believe it was Sunday evening, that a dear pastor, a preacher friend of mine, retired minister, sent to me. This is a letter from the general overseer of the Church of God in 1967, November the 22nd. And it was sent to pastors in Western North Carolina. This is what he said. I am forwarding to you a statement on modest dress that was adopted by the executive council at its recent session. You need to make your congregation aware of the position taken by the executive council. 
let me personally urge you to emphasize the necessity of holiness dress among our members. We are living in a day, now this is 1967. We are living in a day when there is a strong tendency to disregard the place of modest apparel in the life of holiness. We must never slacken in our assertion that holiness in a person's heart will definitely reflect itself in holy behavior and habits. We must not allow our church to become slack in its long time standards. And we must not become weary in our task of instruction and admonition. He went on to say, unless we exercise great care regarding modest dress at this time, we could well see such a tide of unholy array in the church that there will soon be little that we can do about it. Prophetic almost. He said, this is the time that we must maintain the standards of holiness in our lives and proclaim the standards of holiness in our pulpits. And then I want to read to you the letter that was addressed to pastors from that executive council on the statement of modest apparel. This is what the letter said. In the wake of an avalanche of sex-oriented fashions, again, this is 1967, which threatened to infiltrate the church of God, the executive council feels that it would be remiss in its responsibilities as spiritual leaders of the church and guardians of its biblical stand on holiness, both inward and outward, if it did not speak out against these godless fashions. It would be impossible to list everything in detail, but generally speaking, the council strongly suggests that low-cut, Sleeveless dresses and the so-called miniskirts, shorts, slacks, jeans, etc. in no way meet the Bible standard of modest dressing and consequently have no place in the wardrobes of godly women and girls. We take note of the fact that the wearing of miniskirts is virtually non-existent among our lady members. However, we do suggest that the hemline on far too many dresses is indiscreetly high and inconsistent with the scriptural injunction to dress modestly as becometh holiness. In view of the fact that the present day dress fads for men include wearing of shorts and going shirtless, we also appeal for modesty in dress among male members. Then they gave the scriptures in 1 Timothy 2 verses 9 and 10. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness in good works. The council earnestly urges all members of the church, both male and female, to join us in a worldwide, a churchwide rather, rededication based on Romans 12, 1 and 2, which lays the foundation for the outward and inward life. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do you know why they sent this letter out to pastors and to churches? They were trying to guard the church to keep this from infiltrating the church of God. And the message I'm going to preach tonight and have preached since I've been preaching and will continue to, God be in our help, is to guard against this ungodliness that's trying to infiltrate the churches even in this day. Thank God for preachers and pastors that still will be watchmen on the wall. Can somebody say amen? I want to preach to you tonight, having read this letter to you. Anybody know Brother Key Speed? Brother Key Speed took this letter and mailed it to every, I believe, every overstate overseer. You know how many responses he got? Not one. Not one response. 
I'm going to talk to you tonight on the matter of modesty. I'm going to preach and teach and do a little bit of both and just all in there together. The matter of modesty. The Bible begins to address nakedness in Genesis chapter 3 with the revelation that sinful man and sinful woman, uh, women must be covered. And that public nakedness, which we call lewdness, is a sin. Anybody agree with me tonight that nakedness is a sin? That was four of you. Anybody else agree that nakedness is a sin according to the word of God? If you don't believe it, you're not convinced yet, I'll prove it to you before this is over tonight. In past centuries, Christian people were often noted uh, for their modesty, uh, and it was the heathen people uh, who were noted for their immodesty. But today, the line between the professing Christian uh, and the savage tribesman uh, has become increasingly blurred. Today, some so-called Christians, uh, they resort to pagan practices, even in the church, uh, practices of scarification of their bodies, mutilation of their bodies, uh, tattooing of their bodies. In this day, it's not uncommon for church people to pierce their bodies. It's not uncommon for church people to mark and tattoo their bodies. We've got Church of God pastors. I've seen pictures of them at the beach in a pair of shorts with no shirt on. It's not uncommon to see that today. It's not uncommon to see Church of God members today who are getting tattoos and body piercings and and show those pictures without shame or blushing on social media. There are people that call themselves Christians that cut themselves, that mutilate their bodies. Not only are they mutilating their bodies, not only are they piercing their bodies, Not only are they tattooing their bodies and marking their bodies uh, that do not belong to them uh, but belong to God, uh, but they also have thrown off the restraints of modest dress uh, in favor of the trendy and the physically revealing. Can you say amen? The result in this modern America and the modern church uh, has been publicly undressed. What's worse about it today is this is that we've come to think of this as normal. We've come to think of lewdness as normal today. We've come to think of immodesty uh, and nakedness as something that is acceptable, uh, even preferable in our time. Now I know this is something that you don't normally hear preached about during the winter time. Typically we preach these kind of messages in the summertime uh, because in the summertime people start taking their clothes off. I'm telling you, friend, this will preach any time of the year, any day of the year, because it is the Word of God. We're living in a land of unashamed nakedness, and I believe that we need to put some clothes on again. I said in the church and outside the church in the world, we live in a land of unashamed nakedness, and we need to put clothes on again. Now, I already know what somebody's thinking. I already know what some of these on, you know, on Facebook are going to say right off the bat before I get any further than this. They're going to say he's narrow-minded. They're going to say he's legalistic. They're going to say that's legalism. Uh, how, you know, serving God has nothing to do with how you dress. But legalism means to add to the plan of salvation. I'm not telling you tonight uh, that you have to dress a certain way before you can get saved. I'm not telling you you have to put clothes on to get saved. I'm not telling you you have to do anything to get saved except come to Jesus Christ the way that you are and Jesus will save you. Jesus did the work. Jesus paid the price and when you and I respond to him by faith, I don't add anything to that. It is by his grace and his grace alone. When you try to add to the plan of salvation, that is legalism. But I will tell you, friend, that when you've been saved by grace, you're going to want to do everything to please God and to live by the word of the Lord. Can you say amen? In Mark chapter 5, we read of that demoniac of Gadara, how that when Jesus came to him, The Bible describes him, you know, part of that description uh, is that he is naked. He runs around naked. Now, that I don't know if that means he's completely naked uh, or if he was biblically naked. 
by the way God counts nakedness. Whatever the case may have been, he was naked according to the Bible. When he came to Jesus, Jesus never said to him, Sir, before I can help you, before I can set you free, before I can save you, you better go put some clothes on. Jesus saved him just like he was. I'm telling you, the moment he got born again, he didn't put those clothes on to be saved. But when he got saved, the Bible said he was sitting at the feet of Jesus. He was clothed and he was in his right mind. He didn't put clothes on to be saved, but he put clothes on because he got saved and Jesus came to live inside of his heart. Can somebody say amen? Now I want you to notice here, dear God, somebody throw the clock out, please. I may keep you to 10 o'clock tonight. It's all right. I'll try to keep you to 11.45 or 12 on Sunday. I want you to notice the moral and the spiritual qualities related to the function of clothing. In the Bible, I know we don't talk about it in the pulpits today. We don't talk about this much in the teacher stands, but in the Bible, God says a lot about nakedness. God says a lot about lewdness. God talks a lot about the shame of nakedness. He has a lot to say about in it both physically and in the spiritual sense. We know as evidenced by the Song of Solomon, and by many other portions of scriptures uh, that sexual relations between a man and a wife uh, are neither shameful or sinful. The Bible makes that clear for a man and woman to come together in that way. Uh, that is what God ordained from the beginning. But you listen to me. It is sin for a man and woman or a woman to have sexual relationship, uh, any type of sexual relations uh, outside of the marriage covenant. That includes heavy petting. That includes touching sexually. That includes fornication. This is one of the reasons that we don't shack up before we get married. Praise God. I either got to be back here or up there. Amen. This is one of the reasons that we don't shack up and live together before we get married. Amen. Because we open the door up for sexual sins. Can you say amen? I told you of the couple that used to attend this church a number of years ago. They came here for just a short while and they found out I wasn't going to do what they wanted. They went somewhere else and they left. Let me tell you something. I'm not going to change the word of God to make anybody happy or to try to keep somebody on a pew smiling at me. It's God's way and that's the only way. I said it's God's way and that's the only way. If you don't want to go God's way, then just go somewhere else. But it's God's way because God's way is the right way. They wanted me to marry them. And they were living together. I knew they were living together. And I told them, I can't marry you like this. You're living in sin. And she was quick to speak up. Oh, no, preacher. We're not living in sin. We sleep in separate bedrooms. He has his bedroom and I have mine. I said, you mean to tell me that y'all live together and you don't have any kind, of, any kind of sexual sins at all? Oh, no, we have our own bedrooms. I said, well, if that's the case, how'd that little girl get here? How'd your daughter get here? They had no, no, no answer to that. I'm telling you, when we live together outside of holy matrimony, the devil will see to it. I said the devil will see to it uh, that we participate in sexual sins. Can you say amen? The Bible tells us all sexual activity outside of marriage is sin. You listen to me, little girls. That little boy don't want to wait and don't won't want wait on you until the married till you're married. Then you need to tell that little boy to take a hike. I said you need to tell him to go on down the road. That little girl, you know, is a sex crazy. You need to find you somebody else. You need to make sure you maintain your your chasteness until you are married. And then when you are married, God ordains that. Anything beyond that, it is sin in the eyes of God. And I would raise the question, is there any momentary pleasure in this world that's worth losing your soul over, that's worth dying and going to hell over? I can say emphatically that the answer is no. No, there's no sin in this earth worth losing your eternal soul. After Adam's sin in the garden, nakedness became associated with shame. Before sin, there was no shame in nakedness. Adam and Eve, neither one of them wore any clothes at all. 
But the proof that there is shame and nakedness now is the fact that every one of us have on clothes in this house tonight. In the Bible, nakedness also regards sinful or shameful sexual acts. Moses used the words uncover the nakedness to refer to the committing of sinful and sexual acts. But not only just sinful and sexual acts, but also to refer to the idolatry of the nation of Israel. He said in Leviticus 18, 6 and 7, None of you shall approach anyone who is near of kin to him to uncover his nakedness. I am the Lord. The nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother you shall not uncover. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. According to the word of God, Uncovering someone's nakedness uh, was for the purpose of unlawful sexual relations. Uh, it is sinful uh, and it is shameful. Uh, now we read about these type of se sexual acts and sinful acts uh, and they're usually done in secret. Uh, they're usually done behind closed doors uh, where nobody knows. Uh, but then the question has to be raised, what about public nakedness? Uh, what about public lewdness uh, and public, uh, you know, immodesty? According to the Bible, perversions of the flesh either accompany or eventually follow idolatry. This common sin of the children of Israel was seen after the crossing of the Red Sea. In Exodus 32 and 6, the Bible said, And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play while Moses is on the mountain with God, while Moses is in the presence of the Lord, getting the Ten Commandments from God, Aaron's down there with those Israelites, he builds the golden calf. The Bible said these were the people of God. These were people that God had brought out of Egypt land. He had delivered them. He would performed miracles for them. But the first chance they get, the Bible said they're offering sacrifices to this false idol, this golden calf. They ate, they drank, they rose up to play, and they danced around this golden calf. Many commentators believe this. Not only did they eat and drink, but when they rose up to play, they were naked. They were engaging in types of religious prostitution and even orgies. This was all in connection with the people's worship of this golden calf. This was typical of what went on with worship of idols throughout those Gentile nations. Let me tell you something, friend. If you get away, if I get away from the true and living God, if I stop worshiping the true and living God, I will worship the false. I, I said I will give myself uh, over to idolatry. I, I will begin to partake of things uh, that I give up for God, that I laid down uh, when I got right with God. Uh, so I'm telling somebody tonight, uh, it's better to stay with the Lord. Uh, it's better to serve God. Uh, it's better to live holy and be ready when Jesus comes again. Somebody shout amen. The idolatrous ceremonies that accompanied the worship of foreign gods in ancient Israel commonly involved lewd and sexually explicit behavior. Even around the time of Jesus Christ, the Corinth was known the world over for those temple prostitutes. We've preached about them before. The apostle Paul dealt with that when he wrote to the church at Corinth. Young virgin girls were required to serve first in those temples as prostitutes before they could get married. We know that sin and the human nature, it does not change. We still have the same human tendencies today. I said we still have these same human tendencies today. You don't believe that? Just go down to the schoolhouse. Go to your elementary schools. 
Go to your middle schools. Go to the high schools. Listen to me. Our young people are dressing like hookers. They're dressing like prostitutes. And the sad reality of it is, I'm not trying to be ugly to them or mean to them. I'm just telling you where we are living and what's taking place. They dress like prostitutes and they dress like hookers. And it's become a normal way of life to them. It is absolutely normal to see this today. And the sad thing is, you don't just have to go to the elementary school to see it. You can go to a lot of our modern day churches and you'll see them dressed exactly the same way. I'm telling you, friend, somebody's got to come back to the altar. Somebody's got to repent of it. Preachers have got to get a backbone again and stand in the pulpit and say, thus saith the Lord one more time. Elementary school kids, middle school kids, high school kids. Today we see them dressed without enough clothes to go to bed on. Uh, much, much less to go out in public. Now you listen to me. Before you jump down their throats, before you look at them with disgust, you better offer grace to them. I said we better offer grace to those young people. Why is that? Because many of them have no idea about what I'm preaching about right now. Many of them have never been taught anything about modesty. They've never been taught anything from the Bible. They don't have a mom and daddy that takes them to church. They don't have a mom and daddy that sets the example. So you better be careful how you jump on them, how you point your finger at them. We have to offer grace to them and show them by example how we're to dress in this world, what God requires of his people today. Amen. Many of them have never been taught that this kind of dress is not pleasing to God. Many of them don't know that it's contrary to the word of God. And there is a command for us to be modest in this hour. Now I know some of you were born saved. And I know some of you were born sanctified. And I know some of you were born modest. You didn't have, God didn't have to do any work in your life. You, was, you already had it when you got here. You didn't have to have preaching, didn't have to have an order, didn't have to hear a teacher teach, don't have to study your Bible because you got here right. You had everything together, but not everybody was raised that way. I remember when I was in sin, I was literally blind to these things. I was raised in church. My mom and daddy, they lived modest lives, but I was blind to it. I had scales over my eyes. I didn't see one thing wrong with running up down that beach in a pair of shorts with no shirt on. I didn't see any shame in it, working out in my yard like that, you know, going out to town that way. But I'm telling you, friend, the moment Jesus Christ saved me, the moment Jesus came into my heart. Amen. I felt shame to dress that way anymore. I didn't have to change to come to Jesus but when he saved me just like that demoniac of Gadara I put some clothes on and I've been wearing them ever since because Jesus now lives in my heart. Somebody give him a hand of praise tonight. Hallelujah to God. My question is, Sister Albright, you should have stayed another half hour because I got a lot more here. My question is, <laughs> where are the parents today? Why are the parents not dictating the standard of dress for their children? I understand why sinners do it. I understand why that ungodly daddy and ungodly mama let, let that happen. But I don't understand how anybody can call themselves a Christian and not have a dress standard for their children. Why are we not teaching our children today uh, the perversion of clothing to the standards uh, of this society? I'll tell you one of the reasons uh, why parents uh, don't say anything about this. Uh, it's because the parents don't wear any more clothing uh, than the children do. Uh, I said they'll go out just as naked uh, as their children do. Somebody ought to say amen to me tonight. Uh, I'm telling you it's a sad reality uh, when a 50 year old mother uh, is trying to dress immodest uh, like that 17 year old daughter uh, in sexually charged clothing uh, I still believe uh, if mom will get it right uh, if dad will get it right uh, they'll set the boundaries they'll set the standards uh, and it'll change a generation of young people again amen. somebody say amen. amen 
Parents, they let these children dress this way because many of the mom and dads dress exactly the same way. Don't turn me off on, out there just yet. Just hold on to the end. Then you can turn me off. I was at Walmart one day. I don't like Walmart no more than you do. And I saw a mama and her daughter. I wouldn't look at them in the wrong way, but I couldn't help but notice they were dressed like twins. That mama had to be in her 40s. That little girl probably 11, 12, 13 years old. I didn't look in the wrong way, but I didn't notice what they had on. I'm telling you, you couldn't tell which one of them, which cheeks were hanging out. Both of them had their cheeks hanging out. They had their shorts on so short. I, I don't know how in the world you could even call it any kind of covering. And I thought to myself, I became burdened. I, I thought, dear God, here's a mother that is teaching her little girl that it's all right to show yourself this way. It's all right to go out in public that way. I'm telling you, friend, in the eyes of God is still sin. I said in the eyes of God is still a sin and we need to come back to the word of God. Amen. Well say amen or say oh me tonight. We have to be careful. We have to be guarded as Christians not to fall into this trap. Not to fall into this pit. It is your responsibility as moms and dads to teach your children the word of God. It is your responsibility to teach them what the Bible says, what God requires of us, what God's commands are for his people today to teach them about modesty and it has to start with you mom and it has to start with you dad. Don't you tell your child you should dress this way and they see you dressing the opposite. They ought to see a modest lifestyle in you that will impact them in such a way that will cause them to know this is the standard for God's people in this hour. Clothing is God's covering. I'm not preaching my ideas here tonight. I'm not here trying to make you live a certain way. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. You live how you choose to live. Clothing is God's covering. It is his divine and gracious response to human rebellion. When Adam and Eve sinned in that garden, their eyes were open to nakedness. They immediately covered their loins with fig leaves. But the Bible said God clothed them with animal skins to cover the shame of their sin and their nakedness. This was God's human response to their human rebellion. Now I've had people tell me, church people tell me, that God does not care what we wear. Does not care how we dress. God only cares what's in my heart. He doesn't care what I wear doesn't care what I dress. I have two responses to that always. My first response is this. Get your Bible out, sir. Get your Bible out, ma'am, and show me that in the Word of God. Show me in the Bible where God doesn't care how we dress. Show me in the Bible where God doesn't care what we wear. Show me that. I don't usually have to go any further because you can't show me because it's not in here. My second response to that is this then why are you wearing clothes? If God doesn't care about how we dress, God doesn't care anything about this external, then why do you have clothes on? Why are you covered at all? Did you realize that there are laws of the land that say we can't go around naked? I said, did you realize there are laws of the land that say that you and I cannot go around naked? Uh, there's laws that say you can't go into a restaurant without a shirt on. There are laws that says that you can't uh, walk around the mall in a bikini or colored underwear. Tell me the difference. Oh, God, I got to move on here. I'm telling you, we got church ladies today uh, and church men that'll walk up and down the beach in colored underwear, uh, but they wouldn't dare go answer the door for the UPS driver uh, in that same kind of outfit. Come on, say amen. Uh, wouldn't dare wear it to church. Uh, can't wear it through the mall. Uh, can't go into a restaurant like that, uh, but they'll run up and down the beach like that. Come on, say amen. Smile at me. There are laws that said you cannot fly on a plane uh, with a mini skirt and a bra on. Try it. They'll throw you off that plane. The point is this, 
unholy and ungodly men. They write these laws. They uphold these laws. That it's wrong. It is illegal for a person to wear no clothes. It is wrong. It is illegal to have scantily clad outfits in certain areas. They write laws that deal with how we dress in public. They write laws and uphold these laws that you can be arrested. You can be punished if you break those laws and we abide by those laws. Whether we're Christians or not, most people abide by those laws today. But then you're going to try to convince me that a holy God and a righteous God who you and I are representatives of the kingdom of God uh, here on this earth, uh, that he does not care anything about how I dress. Uh, he doesn't care what I wear uh, out here in this world. Uh, the laws of the land may say, uh, you can't walk through the mall in a bikini, ma'am, uh, but God don't care if I do. Uh, the law of the land says, uh, you can't sit in that restaurant without a shirt, sir, uh, but a holy and a righteous God uh, does not care if I do. Uh, I'm just telling you if that's the case then how come in the beginning why in the beginning when Adam and Eve presented themselves before God in that little skimpy outfit that covering of the loins why did God say that is not enough you're not covered properly why did God kill those animals why did he cover them in skins why did he put coats on them I'll tell you why friend because God has a biblical standard of modesty and and how we ought to dress to please him. Somebody raise your hands and give him praise tonight. They covered their nakedness with fig leaves. But God said you're still not covered properly. So God covered them in coats of animal skins. If unholy and ungodly men recognize that it does matter our outward appearance. How much more do you think it matters to a holy God? Amen. It matters to God how the Christian dresses. It matters how people dress in this world. If it did not matter to God, then God would have never put that in the Bible in Mark chapter 5. There would have never been any mention of that man, that naked man, before he got saved. It would have never been any need to mention that he had put clothes on. It would have said that when he put clothes on, Jesus would have responded, Sir, you don't need to do that. It doesn't matter how you dress. No, the Bible put that in there for a reason to show us how you dress does not save you. But when you get saved, it's going to affect how you dress. Somebody say amen. Say amen online tonight. When he said we're to dress modestly, and he dealt with the matter of modesty, he is dealing with the matter of our dress and our outward appearance. Now the same people would say, we're not walking around naked. Is it all right if I preach a little while longer tonight? The, those people say, now we're not walking around completely naked. I, I've got clothes on. I told you the story of a preacher. Uh, you know, a church in California, a man walked in an overcoat, walked up the front of the church, took his overcoat off, and he's stark naked. What would you have done? You know, we used to throw towels over them when they, lay, when they got slain in the spirit. I don't see we have to have any towels much around anymore. You know Why? Because people ain't getting slain in the spirit. I wish we had to have a towel on every bench. You may say that again. We used to have to have towels laying everywhere because when ladies would get slain in the spirit, we would cover them so you couldn't, so it wouldn't be immodest. We don't have to have towels too much in the church anymore because people not being slain in the spirit. Come on, say amen. I got to preach at another time. I'm just telling you here, friend. They say we're not naked. We've got clothes on. We're not completely nude. That pastor, by the way, walked down and gave that man a hug and told the church to give him applause for expressing himself this way. That was a so-called church. They say we're not completely naked. You don't have to be completely nude to be naked in the eyes of God. I said you don't have to be completely birthday suit naked in the eyes of God to be naked. In John 21, while Peter was still dressed in his undergarment, the Bible said he was considered naked by biblical standards because he had taken off his outer garment. In John 21 and 7, therefore that disciple whom Jesus saith, 
whom Jesus loved, saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat upon him, for he was naked and did cast himself out into the sea. They're out there in the sea. They're working. He takes off his outer garment. He's not standing there in a pair of underwear. He has his undergarment on. But the Bible said according to that undergarment, he was still considered naked in the eyes of God. That undergarment actually covered more of his body than most of the modern shorts, most of the swimwear that we see men in today. But the Bible said even with that on, that the Bible said he was naked. A decent period person did not appear in public uh, dressed without the outer garment uh, because it was associated with public shame. There is no shame in nakedness today. We don't blush today when it comes to taking our clothes off. I'm talking about the church. I'm not talking about that world out there. That world's blind. That world's bound up in sin. But the church seems to take it off more and more and more. And we're not ashamed. And preachers don't say anything about it anymore. Teachers don't teach it anymore. Moms and dads don't teach it to their children anymore. I'm just telling you, friend, the word of God is the same. It's always be the same. You can change all you want, but you cannot change God's holy word. A decent person that time did not appear in public dress without the outer garment because it associated with public shame according to the Bible. A person does not have to be stark naked to be shamefully naked. In Isaiah 47, we see that the taking off of the skirt or even the uncovering of the thigh or making bare the leg was nakedness by biblical standards. Isaiah 47, 1 through 3. I'm just preaching Bible to you here tonight. I'm not preaching my philosophies or my ideas. I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. I'm not trying to change how you dress or how you live. I'm telling you what the Bible says and you do with it what you do with it. Isaiah said, come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For you shall no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grind meal. Remove your veil. Take off the skirt. Uncover the thigh. Pass through the rivers. Your nakedness shall be uncovered. Yes, your shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance and I will not arbitrate with a man. According to the word of God, God considered anything exposed above the knee to be naked and to be shameful. Did you realize that Isaiah's nakedness, what he referred to here as nakedness, would not be noticed today at a beach party? It wouldn't be noticed at a picnic. It wouldn't be noticed at a church get together, a church cookout, uh, making the leg bare, uh, uncovering the thigh, uh, are viewed today uh, not only as normal practice, uh, but they are considered and practiced as one's liberty. Somebody said, Preacher, uh, you're not going to tell me how to dress. Uh, preacher, you're not going to tell me how to live. That's exactly right. Uh, you're going to live exactly how you want to live. Uh, I want to tell you, friend, uh, how you live. It's how you stand before God in judgment one day. And if you want to stand before God and hear him say a, well, a job well done, then we better live according to the word of God, according to the book. Amen. According to the word of God, at an exposed sty, anything above the knee was considered naked. Bearing the leg was considered naked. In the eyes of God. While the naked body was not uncommon for paganism. Being with one's outer garment. Making bare the leg. Uncovering the thigh. Was considered to be immodest. And even shameful among God's people. It was considered to be shameful and sinful. And it's still shameful. And it's still sinful in the eyes of a holy God. This is the reason. In 1967. 
that the general overseer uh, is, is telling the pastors, uh, you got to preach this. Uh, you got to teach this in the pulpit uh, about modesty uh, because that mess, that immodesty is trying to get in our churches. Uh, it's trying to get on the teacher stands. Uh, it's trying to get in the choirs. Uh, it's trying to get on the platform. Uh, here we are, 2022, uh, and he said if we don't do something, uh, it's going to come to a point we can't do anything about it. Uh, I'm afraid that that's where we are today. Uh, amen to stand for it again uh, you would tear most churches up uh, to take a stand again for it uh, it would break most churches in half uh, but preachers have got to make a decision uh, am I going to preach to please the masses uh, or am I going to preach the word of God uh, and let it fall and fall and let somebody be convicted by the word of God somebody say man I'm not jockeying for a position I'm trying to tell you what the Bible says God has a biblical dress code for the church. Well, preacher, I'm thankful for those old timers. I'm thankful for the way they lived and they meant well. But let me tell you something. Everything I read to you tonight from that letter from the general overseer, everything had scripture to back up everything that he said. He had Bible to back up everything that he said. And everything I've said to you tonight has come straight from the word of God. Like it, don't like it, love it, hate it, doesn't matter to me. I'm just responsible for preaching to you what the Bible says. But every one of us will stand before God and give an account of how I lived according to the word of God. I'm not telling you you've got to change how you dress before you get saved. But what I'm telling you is this. Is that when Jesus comes into your heart, when you are washed by the blood of the Lamb, it's going to change your life. And then your desire is going to be to please Him and to learn the word of God and to live by the word of God to walk in the light of God's holy word somebody give him a hand of praise tonight hallelujah my, 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 my. it is biblical of how God views modesty history shows us that God's people cover their bodies in public God's people cover their bodies when they're out there in that world while pagans often uncover theirs. I don't care if it's 1967 or 2022, God's word remains the same. God covered Adam and Eve in that garden. And ever since that day, Satan has been trying to strip man of his clothing. God put clothes on man. And ever since then, the devil's been trying to talk people out of them. Where are these Oh, these little silly namby-pamby preachers today. They're afraid to take a stance on something like this. They say holiness. They use that word holiness a lot. But they don't ever talk about anything. I said they don't ever deal with anything. They're afraid to preach about modesty today. Because this is not popular. This is not preached in a lot of pulpits anymore. I want to tell you something, friend. You go back to 1967. Go back to the 70s. Go back to the 80s when they preached about these things. Go back when Church of God people dressed modest. And they didn't just do it because a preacher said it, but because they had strong convictions about the Word of God. And look at how the fire fell in those places. Look at how the fire shot across in those meetings. Look at the power of God that moved in the church in that day today. We had to bring in clowns, uh, pop in smoke, uh, had to get entertainers uh, because we're so worldly. Uh, I believe if we get back to the biblical standard uh, of the Word of God, uh, the fire will fall again, the rain will come. Uh, God will breathe life into the church one more time. Somebody shout, Amen. Great God, I got a little bit more. Can I preach a little bit longer, Sister Audrey? You're the only one that matters right now, your decision. Can I preach a little longer? She said, yes, go right on, Brother Shelton. God covered Adam. Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves to what they thought was right. But God said, your way's wrong. Your way's not right. And then God covered them properly. You can listen to that jack-legged preacher tell you, it's all right, run around your colored underwear up and down the beach. 
You can do that all you want, but I want to know how God thinks about it. I want to know what God's word says about how I am to present my body in this world as a representative of the kingdom of God and a representative of his son. Can you say amen? amen. i got to close. I'm going to close in just a minute, sister. I'll just I had a little more time. We need to repent of the sin of nakedness and once again adorn ourselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. B.H. Clinton and said, any time a nation, a people, begin to go away from God, he said the very first thing that they start doing is taking their clothes off. The very first thing they do when people start getting away from God, they start taking their clothes off. They're taking more and more and more off in this day. Can you see, man? A preacher can preach on abortion, can preach on drinking, can preach on pornography, can preach on adultery. A preacher can preach on murder and incest. And nobody in the church ever tries to justify these sins. I've never had anybody in the church tell me it's okay to, to commit incest, preacher. I'm a Christian. I believe it's all right to commit incest. I never had a Christian come to me and say, Brother Shelton, I don't think it's I don't think anything wrong with murder. I think it's all right to watch pornography. I don't believe God cares about how we do it. Nobody says anything about these sins. You can preach it's wrong for a woman to wear a dress. And people in the church will say, Amen, Brother Shelton, that's good preaching. You can preach it's wrong for a man to put a woman's skirt on. And people will say, Woo, praise God. He, boy, he's preaching tonight. Preach on a murder. Preach on abortion. Preach on pornography. Preach on incest. Preach on drinking. Preach on all of these things. And people will say amen to it. But let that same preacher preach about a woman wearing, wearing a man's pair of pants. Let that man, let that preacher preach about a woman wearing a skirt, uh, uh, you know, not wearing shorts and halter tops. Let that preacher preach about a woman, uh, you know, it's not right for her to go around in, in a bikini, run around half naked in mini skirts, uh, and you're going to have World War III going on. Uh, you're going to be in for a fight. Somebody's going to get mad at you. Uh, Somebody's going to turn you off. Uh, Somebody's going to say you're a fanatic. Uh, Somebody's going to say you're old-fashioned. Uh, well, let me tell you something. I am old-fashioned uh, because this book goes back an awful a long way. I said it goes back an awful long way. You can preach against murder and they'll shout amen but you preach on modesty and they will turn you off today. I'm already going to have some people not talk to me after this. I'm already going to have some people unfollow us on Facebook. If you do it'll be because you don't want to hear the word of God. I'm not trying to be arrogant. I just know what I believe. I know what that book says. They say it's closed line preaching. Come on, sister, get ready to play softly. Or play loud, hard, soft, whatever it's going to take tonight. They say it's closed line preaching. I'm not preaching closed line preaching. It's biblical preaching. It is biblical preaching. God has a dress code for people. He had a dress code for Adam and Eve. And he has a dress code for you and I today. Churches have been split. Friendships have been severed. The work of Christ has been damaged in some places because so many people insist on claiming something is right that God says is wrong. I've got preacher, preacher friends used to be friends of mine, but this divides us today. Let me say that again. I've got men that used to be my friend, preacher friends, that believe this, preach this, live this. But they don't believe it anymore. They don't preach it anymore. They don't stand for it anymore. And it is severed. It has divided our friendship. Let me tell you something, friend. You walk with God and you preach God's word, you'll walk alone. If you live sold out, you live a holy life, you'll walk alone. But I found out that if you walk with God, you realize you're never alone. I said, when you walk with God, you're never alone. You might have some friends that turn away from you. You might have some family members that look their nose down at you. Let me tell you something, friend. We're not living to please people. We're living to please the one that gave us life. We're living the one to please the one that saved us, that redeemed us. I'm not interested in your thoughts or your opinions of how I live my life, but I want to know what God says, what pleases him, and then I want to live it to the best that I can for 
the glory of God. So you walk on down the road, preacher friend. And I'm still going to be preaching the Bible. Still going to be preaching the word of God. It is a matter of modesty. And God deals with it in his word. Not dressing in a modest manner. Covering our bodies as a sin in the eyes of God. I said not dressing in a modest manner. Covering our bodies as a sin in the eyes of God. That is the word of God and we'll all be judged. Based on how I obeyed the word of God. Now we give people grace to grow. Because everybody's at a different place in this race. Everybody's walking in different light. But the point is, how in the world are they going to know except they have a preacher that will preach to them? That's what the Bible says. How will they know if they don't have a preacher that will tell them this is what the Bible says? How will they know if they don't have a teacher that will say this is what God's word, this is what God requires of us? Be graceful to those that are growing. Greatest example you can live to anybody is to live it in front of them and let them see. Listen, I've had people look at me in the summertime. They ain't hardly got no clothes on. They say, I'm a Christian. I love the Lord. And I've got clothes on. They look at me like I've lost my mind. They look at me like I'm crazy because i got a pair of pants on in the summertime. Don't they, Sister Tina? Sister Tina did that one time. Before she got saved, she came over to the church one day. We was working, trying to get her, to get her saved, trying to get her in church. And I had on it was summer, dead of summer heat. I was sweating. <laughs> and she said, I don't understand why he's got all them clothes on. I had a shirt and pants on. I don't know why. That's, oh, my goodness. He's got on clothes. She's a heathen. According to Brother Charlie, she's still a heathen. No, she. <laughs> but she said when she left, I don't know how he can stand that. It's so hot. See, she had scales. She was blind to it. God saved her. God changed her, opened her eyes, changed her life. God opened her eyes. God changed her life. In closing, my grandfather used to call it a jawbreaker. I'm going to give you a jawbreaker. Our problem is not external. Come on, you bunch of holy sanctified people. I know what somebody's going to say. Oh, wait a minute, Brother Shelton. You've been preaching, you've been preaching external the whole time. But our problem is not an external problem. You can't put holiness on. I said you can't put holiness on. Am I doing all right, Sister Shelton? She's going to take me home and feed me tacos tonight. It's Taco Wednesday. Our problem is not an external problem. Our problem is an internal problem. We got a heart problem in the church. Let me tell you something, friend. You can dress it a certain way and still go straight to hell when you die. Muslims will do it. Those Muslims women, you can't see anything but their eyes. That You talk about modest covering. I mean, they've gone to the extreme with that. But their hearts, they don't believe in Jesus. They believe he's a prophet. They're not saved. They'll go to hell dressed like that. The problem is not external. The problem is internal. It is a heart problem. You get that heart right. It is impossible uh, for that divine nature, uh, the Spirit of God, to take up residence in that heart, uh, to cleanse that heart with the blood of Jesus, uh, and God divine his, his Spirit into that life, into that heart, uh, and then, my friend, it's going to show up on the outside. Uh, that tree's going to begin to bear fruit. Uh, that tree's going to show I'm a holy vessel. Uh, it begins in the heart, uh, and when you get heart holiness, uh, you'll have holiness all over your life. Uh, I said it'll show up on the outside in your appearance, your attitude, your actions, and your appetites. We need to get our heart right with God again. Well, somebody shout amen tonight. My, 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 my. It is a heart problem. It's a heart problem. It's a heart issue. We can get that heart right with God. I tell you, friend, everything else will follow. Everything else will follow. God does deal in how we dress. You don't believe it? That's between you and God. 
But I have, Sister Sharon, I've never laid down one thing. I was ashamed how I dressed after I got saved. And I'm glad God sanctified me. I said, I'm glad he sanctified me. Get the divine, stand with me, please. Get the divine impartation of God's spirit in that heart. And you will see a change in that person. It is a matter of modesty today. Be careful how you jump on those young people at school. Be careful how you jump on the center because they have scales over their eyes. Give grace to the blind. I said give grace to the blind. But when Jesus comes in that heart, I think all of us will be like that demoniac. We'll be clothed in our right mind. One preacher said when you run around naked in this world it's because you're not in your right mind. The Bible said when he got saved he put clothes on and now he's thinking right. He had his right mind about him. It's got to be in the heart, friend. We've had people that's dressed this church is a conservative church. We've had people come to this church and not long they start dressing differently. Then they get mad over something. Why do people do that? Why do they get mad over things? Because they're people. They get mad over something, they'll leave the church, they'll go somewhere else, they'll quit church, and, and a week later they dress just like they were before. They're right back dressed. You see, it wasn't in the heart. Wasn't in the heart. Don't just be something to try to fit in here. But seek the Lord. Draw close to God. When you start drawing close to God, God will start talking to you and show you the things that's not pleasing to Him. He'll begin to deal with you in those matters, those biblical matters. He'll make a holy vessel out of us. He's working to conform us to the image of His Son. I want to be holy inwardly. I want to be holy externally. I want to be a holy vessel, sanctified and made meet for the Master's use, prepared unto every good work, a vessel of honor. I want every head bowed and every eye closed tonight. I pray you ain't all mad at me. I know where I'm preaching. I know who I'm preaching to tonight. God has burdened my heart with this. If they were concerned about it back then, getting in the church, infiltrating the church, how much more should we be concerned about it today? If you're here tonight and you're lost, I don't know. I believe maybe we're all saved, but I want to give an opportunity. I don't want to close this service out and go home and eat tacos without giving you an opportunity to come and be saved if you're not. You listen to me. You don't have to change anything about how you're living to come to Jesus. You don't have to change your wardrobe. You don't have to change anything. You come to him the way that you are. And I guarantee you when he comes in, he'll do the changing in you. He'll begin to work in your life. He'll begin to show you the things. Try to bring you in line with his word. Won't he do it, Brother Jalen? Won't he do it, son? God's still working on this young man. Won't he do it, Brother Eddie? He'll begin to work in your life and try to bring you. He's trying to work and carve in us, carve out in us what brings glory to him. If you're lost and undone, you need to be saved. You need to be saved. These altars are open for you to come tonight. Would you come? If you've got some areas of your life that God's dealt with you over, and you're saved, but you want to get those things sanctified, these altars are open for you to come tonight. 
there's areas of your life that you know God's dealing with you. I appreciate Brother Eddie coming. He's a good man. God's helping him. He's humble. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Some of you brethren come help pray with him tonight. If you're here and you say, Brother Shelton, I, I want to grow in God. I don't want to just stay where I'm at. Listen to me, young converts. You've got to grow in God. Listen to me, old converts. You've got to grow in God. We've got to keep moving forward, keep praying, keep growing in His grace. I can't just hang around where I'm at because if I do, I'll be gone, I'll be out. The devil's smarter than you are. He's smarter than I am. But if I'll do what God's told me to do, Oh, great God in heaven. God will keep me a step ahead of the devil. God will give me the grace from day to day. God will see that I walk with him. God will keep me in the race. God will welcome me home one day. Anybody else? I'm a little surprised tonight there's only one in this order that says I need to get closer to God. I told the Lord before this service, Lord, I'm going to preach this message tonight. I don't, know, I don't know how everybody will receive it, but this one thing I do know, Lord, I don't want people to just nod their head with it, say amen to it. I want people to be changed by it. I want it to change people's hearts. I want you to do a work in our hearts, oh God, that we don't resist and reject the Word of God, but we want to line up with it. We want to obey the Word of God. We want to do what the Word of God says to do. God work in my heart God reveal to me those areas that are not pleasing unto you deal with the places in my life God that I'm struggling with give me grace give me strength in those areas Touch me, Jesus. Oh, 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 oh. Touch me, Jesus. Touch me, Holy Ghost. I want to say this gently with love in my heart. Some of us here tonight, you need to put that flesh in its place again. You need to dig a hole and just have a funeral right here and lay that flesh in the ground again. Lay that old man, that old dead corpse that you're trying to carry around. You need to take the axe out and lay it to the root tonight. For in my flesh there is no good thing. And they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Listen, our own carnality, our own flesh, it profits nothing the Bible says. It is the Spirit of God that quickens. It is the Spirit that brings life. Lord, help me not to preach in my flesh. Help me not to preach in my carnality. But let me preach and work in the Spirit of God. Let me walk in the Spirit. Let me be led by the Spirit of the Lord. And where the Spirit is, there's liberty. There's liberty in that life. There's liberty in that church. There's liberty in that service. Work in my heart, oh God. If you need to have a funeral, have it tonight. If you need to bury some things, bury it tonight. Come on, help me.